Between 1981 and 2018, 345 rap songs made it into the top 10 at one point or another. Notice how rap has these enormous swings in popularity. Of the 48 songs that got a top 10 listing in 2014, only three were rap songs, Bang Bang, Anaconda, and Don't Tell Em, but in 2018, there was an explosion of rap, and suddenly there were 38 rap songs in the top 10. 2018 featured more rap than any year ever. But it's no surprise to you that different genres go in and out of popularity. And the easy explanation for that would just be to say that it's whatever's hot or whatever's popping or whatever. But I wanna figure out why what's hot is hot. So I pulled the data and crunched the numbers and we're gonna talk about the reasons for the up and down popularity of rap music. I'm Clifford Stumby, the Pop Song Professor. I have my own channel where I explain song lyrics and teach people how to write them. And Anthony invited me to share a video with you guys while he's out on tour. And I know this isn't an album review or a discussion of recent releases. It's more a video essay. And I'm grateful that I get to share what I found with you. Hopefully it helps you to put your understanding of new rap albums in a social context while you watch future videos from Anthony. When we look at the number of rap songs that made it into the top 10, we immediately notice an upward trend. Since the late 80s, there's a clear line through the data that shows us rap place in the top 10 has been growing at about three quarters of a song per year. And since an average of 56 songs make it into the top 10 every year, in 2061 mathematically, the only thing on the radio will be rap music. I'm just kidding, but the point is that rap music is growing quickly in mainstream popularity, which probably doesn't need to be said since it made up 59% of popular music in 2018. But there have also been times that rap was really unpopular. It fluctuates. So let's start at the beginning. Rap was born in the 1970s and 1979 through 1986 was a great time for old school hip hop, but it was still a young genre and wasn't popular in the mainstream, which is probably a good thing because if it had gone to the charts right away, it might have solidified and not had the chance to grow and develop. When Rakim and Big Daddy Kane started dropping music in the mid 80s, they changed up the flow and added way more rhyming, proving that hip hop could have a lot more variety both in style and subject matter and ushering in the first golden age of hip hop, 1986 through 1991 roughly. Interestingly, if we look at our data, the first year to include significant amounts of hip hop in the top 10 was 1989 with four songs, including Wild Thing and Funky Cold Medina. The hard work of a lot of different MCs had paid off. A previously vibrant but stylistically monolithic genre had been noticed by the mainstream for its ability to innovate and do some pretty interesting things. I think this made it more viable for the mainstream and by the mid 90s, hip hop was a small but important genre on the charts. After that, rap kept growing into the late 90s with artists like Will Smith, Biggie, Tupac, Puff Daddy, and Busta Rhymes until 2000 when it almost disappeared from the charts. Now, no one actually knows why hip hop lulled, but consider what was happening at the time. From 1994 to 1997, we experienced the heat of the West Coast and East Coast rap rivalry. But in 1996, Tupac was killed, and in 1997, the notorious B.I.G. was assassinated. These two were the respective leaders of the West and East Coast sounds. And I think the mainstream void in hip hop could have been caused not only by their absences from the charts, but also from the rivalry dying out. Things always get more attention when there's conflict, and with no rivalry, the mainstream seems to have turned its attention elsewhere. It didn't take long though. From 2000 to 2003, rap went from three songs in the top 10 to around 20, where it stayed steady until 2012. While not a golden age in the same innovative way the late 80s were, it was a golden age of popularity as rap regularly took control of 25 to 35 percent of the top 10, whereas it had only controlled 14 to 18% in the 90s. So what caused it to take off stronger than ever? Well, of all the things happening around then, I think perhaps the two most interesting events were the rises of two artists in particular, Jay-Z, and Eminem. Jay-Z was close friends with the Notorious B.I.G. and carried on the legacy of East Coast rap, eventually making a name for himself. His first album dropped in 1996, and he dropped an album every year after until 2003, which in terms of strategy of taking advantage of the void left by the greats, couldn't have worked out better for him. His prolific work ethic and established sound made it hard for him not to become a rap icon. But perhaps the biggest shock in hip hop history up to that point was a white MC from Detroit making it big. Eminem released the Slim Shady LP in 1999 and the Marshall Mathers LP in 2000, which affected the hip hop game in two ways. First, while Eminem wasn't the first white rapper to break the top 10, he was the first to see huge mainstream success, becoming the highest selling artist since Elvis Presley, making a white rapper 
a rap icon. Second, his intense rhyming and unique flows changed the game for rappers. In fact, in his 2003 book, There's a God on the Mic, MC Cool Mo D claims that while Melly Mel, Rakim, and Biggie all took their turns influencing the flow of generations of rappers, Eminem took over in 2003. And while he wasn't the first rapper to be angry or to use complicated rhyme schemes, when you combine all that with Eminem being white, that's a pretty huge anomaly. You may be familiar with the Elvis effect. Dan Charnas talks about it in relation to Eminem in his book, The Big Payback. Basically, it describes when a member of the mainstream culture appropriates a cultural artifact from a subculture to give it mainstream appeal. Although Elvis was primarily a rock and roll singer, before him in the 60s, soul was a facet of black culture. After Elvis, a white guy did it well, all the white people hopped on board too. People have a tendency to pay more attention to people like themselves. So after Eminem, rapping became something that white guys would buy into more because a white guy was modeling it. The overall effect of Jay-Z and Eminem's influence was to skyrocket the popularity of rap into the mid 2000s. After they jump-started it, artists like 50 Cent, Kanye West, Ludacris, Lil Wayne, and the Black Eyed Peas carried the baton into the mid-2010s, where rap's mainstream popularity, apparently, died again. It was a slow decline from 2009 to 2014. No dramatic changes, just fewer and fewer top 10 rap songs each year. I like to think that the reason here was that rap was getting too commodified. The rap on Top 40 radio wasn't staying true to its roots, and a lot of artists didn't have anything to say, so more rap just meant more of the same. Like a lot of trends, it spiked, and as people got tired of hearing the same thing, it petered out to make room for artists like Taylor Swift, Katy Perry, or Justin Bieber. But the lessened popularity, I think, gave the chance for rebirth, the like of which we hadn't seen since the 80s or the early 2000s. Because while we only had an average of 6.2 rap songs in the top 10 every year from 2012 to 2016, 2018 exploded to 38, the most rap songs in the top 10 of any year. It's gonna be years before we understand the rebirth of rap into the mainstream, but to theorize for now, I took a look at the songs in 2018 and found two central themes, mumble rap and Drake. 24% of the songs in the top 10 shared strong features with the mumble rap genre, and 26% of songs in the top 10 were by or featured Drake. Now Drake certainly set the example for rappers to talk about more personal, emotional issues, becoming kind of the de facto leader of the conscious rap movement. And as a person who appeals to almost all demographics, he did what Eminem did for hip hop even more effectively. His music, his influence, and his persona all contributed to the recent rebirth. But while Drake had a huge influence, it's impossible to say that just one thing caused this resurgence. And I wonder whether the most important factor might have been mumble rap. A lot of people credit Future with inventing it on his track, Tony Montana, but it took a few years for it to catch onto the mainstream. It wasn't until 2016 that a true mumble rap song made it into the top 10 with designers Panda. Coincidentally, the very next year, rap overall showed up in the top 10 125% more. I'm not saying that mumble rap saved hip hop from decline and started another golden era of rap, but we have to recognize the fact that it at least seems to be one of the factors that helped jumpstart this new popularity. There were a lot of factors, Drake, streaming, SoundCloud, but mumble rap seems to have done what the East Coast, West Coast rivalry did for rap music in the 90s. It created conflict between people who hate it and people who loved it, creating a need for listeners to stake their claims to the kinds of music they did or didn't support. And maybe in some way this helped cause the resurgence of rap into the popular conscience and mainstream music for yet another golden age of popularity. Obviously a lot of this is theory and my own personal ideas, but this is a conversation worth having as we try to understand music, culture, the nature of popularity. And it's a conversation that I'd like to keep having with you. You can check out my channel, The Pop Song professor. Over there I've got a video that mathematically, with the help of Anthony, tries to answer the question of whether rap lyrics have gotten dumber. I've also got a video that uses 32 Eminem songs to try to understand how he writes lyrics. And thanks for letting me be here, Anthony and viewers. It's a huge privilege and an honor, and I hope that you guys have a great day.